Welcome everybody to our heat pump action group for manufacturers, distributors, and our industry stakeholders. And um, we are, I'm going to turn that off. So our agenda is packed and um, a lot to talk about what's going on in the industry. So um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint um, to get started. Wanted to just remind everyone that um, EBC, we're a trade association of the energy efficiency companies and that um, antitrust law, we don't discuss any pricing or territory collusion or anything like that. We always just like to mention that at the beginning of our calls. And um, a lot of times I like to take a little time to get introductions, but I think we're gonna run out of time today. So just wanna say thank you for joining. Um, I'd like to um, introduce our co-chairs and um, just have them say hello real quick. And Sean Lamonds, do you wanna give a quick start? Yes, hello, Sean Lamonds from Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC. And uh, happy to be here. It's, I think it feels like so long ago that I was last here, so. <laughs> yeah, I know, definitely. Okay, great. Matt Baker. Yeah, hi there. Matt Baker with Daikin Comfort Technologies here. Great. Um, and Pete Perret from J.A. Larson is also a co-chair members. You guys have access to our website um, at ebco.org. And that takes you right into all the meetings that we've had in the last year. It includes a PowerPoint, a recording, and um, highlights or minutes so that you could go and look up any past topic that you would like to do, uh, take a look at. And then also we have a library of um, all of our other resources as well. So um, just as a reminder, you and if you want to look at upcoming meetings, those are always on the first page of our website that you can sign up for. Um, so we did do the welcome introductions. And if you're not a member of the EEBC, um, when we send out the PowerPoint, uh, you can go ahead and fill out an application, join the EEBC at any time. So I'm just going to jump in if everybody is OK with that. A um, couple, an exciting reminder for everyone is that um, in our last meeting, we had a deep dive discussion about the heat pump rebates from the city of Denver and as a part of their electrification rebates that ran from, I believe, Earth Day, April 22nd through um, the middle of June. And then they uh, closed except for some of the um, low income equity um, rebates that were still out there. And we had a discussion about what the EBC had recommended prior to them releasing the rebates. And um, the forecasting group had four main recommendations. We all kind of walked through it and debated it. Um, I circled back to Denver. And so what they would like to do is have two feedback sessions with the EBC contractors and contractors who are not members. And we have scheduled that for September 14th, um, which is a Tuesday from three to five o'clock. That is a Zoom meeting. It will be the exact same discussion and content on Friday, the September the 23rd. That's an early meeting, contractor style, 6.30 to um, eight. And they are sending out a pre, like, three question survey on um, next week on Tuesday. So you'd be able to forward that out to any of your contractors, distributors, or anyone that you think would they'd like to have feedback on. A couple quick things. They're looking for feedback from the contractors who wanted to participate and didn't and why, as well as the contractors who did participate and even the ones who decided to only do two rebates and then stopped because they thought they would run out of money, as well as there was three contractors that installed over 30 heat pumps. And so they have this very wide range. So they are working on grabbing all the analytics they can based on the feedback from our last discussion 
and they're going to present their results with analytics and what they are looking for to relaunch the program they talked about as early as October this year or January next year. So they're looking to relaunch pretty quick. So they really want to get robust, um, direct feedback about what we believe would make the program work the best for the contractors and for um, and for Denver. So um, after this meeting, we can forward those invites to everybody who's on the call so that you can forward them to your contractors that you know who participated or would have liked to have, because this is it. They might do some other meetings, but they want to start with the EBC first. So that's excellent news for us. Um, and I think they see a lot of value in the fact that the members of the EBC are the more high performance contractors, manufacturers, distributors, and that type of thing. Any questions before I move on? I want to get these two announcements and make sure that we get great participation in those two meetings. What were the dates again, real quick? Yeah, so they are on the screen there, but Tuesday, September yep, 14th at three o'clock and Friday, September 23rd at 6.30 a.m. We're doing the 6.30 time to see if we get contractors that show up in person. There will be burritos, continental breakfast, and coffee. <laughs> that meeting. Hey, Patricia, Ann here. I just wanted yes. to give you an update that you hadn't heard, I don't think, yet. Um, in the Belco meeting on Tuesday, uh, Jan was on and said uh, the plan has been narrowed down to January. It has. Okay. So that's an update since I last talked to them. So yeah, the press. hot off the press and which, you know, isn't a lot of time and we want to make sure that our feedback is heard and hopefully helps them really develop the next iteration, you know, the relaunch. So thank you. So okay. next, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to compliment you on getting those meetings set up and getting contractor voices heard. That's awesome. Thanks. And the goal is, of course, they had asked, you know, we don't want to have just a complaint session. They really want to look at what needs to go into the relaunch. And I think all of our suggestions in our last meeting are excellent, but I think they really want to hear directly. So I think anyone who was on that call, on this call, regardless of, you know, if you're a manufacturer, distributor, contractor, you guys also represent the voice of the contractors. Um, we'd ask that you definitely be there. I always like the in-person meetings because I think it ends up being a much more robust conversation. Um, so we'll record both. Great, any other comments or questions? Awesome. Okay, then the exciting uh, announcement that we've been talking about for the last five months is EBC partnered with ICAS and Julius Education and got a grant from the city of Denver to create a hiring pipeline for entry level uh, employees for contractors. And there is a couple tracks in that. One is orientation for um, HVAC heat pump, as well as installation, air sealing, raters. Um, and lighting. And the last one, um, we're toying with this idea of having a group that, so it's like the shell envelope is the installation air sealing group um, and the raiders and duct work and that type of thing. And then having a, um, not emerging trends, but more of um, technical trends and demand response, load shifting, um, kind of the, the new things that are coming with beneficial electrification and time of use and whatnot. So those are the four um, groups that we're um, looking at supplying um, students who are not going to college, GEDs. We're recruiting 4,000 um, students in Colorado, putting them through um, it's like a week of modules about building science principles, energy efficiency installation. Um, and if they want to go on, we have a separate track for heat pumps, which actually has a BPI training in it. Um, it has the, I mentioned the building science and energy efficiency. Then it also has a refrigerant training. So 
is a full 12 week of program of tech training for a heat pump technician. And it is free and available so that any of um, the graduates coming out of that, if you are a member of the EVC and in an action group, if a contractor is, they get first right of fuse to all of those grads from all those programs. So we've talked about it, but we haven't gotten contractors to sign up. And so um, we're going to have our first round of the entry, general entry level students coming through and the week of October 24th. So please, um, we'll send out a, another separate email for you about this so that you can forward to your contractors. So they're hiring managers and their production managers and sign up the contractor so we can start getting them ready and connecting them with the students who are graduating. And the other piece is if your uh, contractors, um, if they are hiring someone and they'd like to have this curriculum be on part of their onboarding. So the last first two weeks, typically a lot of times they'll send out the new employee on ride-alongs. So while they're doing ride-alongs, they could be taking these modules and getting the additional training for free and have that be a part of their training um, when they hire someone new, whether and put them through the program after they hire them. So there's two tracks that a contractor can use to create more retention and hopefully have a more um, engaged and interested new hire entry level who will stay because they know what the expectations are for the job. Any questions about that? Or comments? Patricia, I just got to thinking, I, something I forgot to ask in the past is, yeah. This training program, is it going to cover just residential? I, I And it's probably obvious somewhere and I just missed it. Or is it um, broad? It is broad enough for residential and commercial. Okay. Lighting specifically, our lighting action committee is a commercial committee, by the way. Hmm. Um, but um, it's more the general principles of building science, energy efficiency, um, you know, what the jobs could look like. They can actually watch videos of people talking about their different positions and help them direct them into, I don't like to say good green jobs because I think our industry, green is really high performance. And so um, I think that it would be, if it's an entry level person who's getting into the industry and interested, this is an excellent place for them to go learn more and be able to say, I think I'm more interested or maybe my, my aptitudes are a better fit for um, being a technician. Or it also includes customer service in that group. So you know, if somebody um, wants to work in the front desk or take calls or schedule, it's not just technical. It's looking at all the roles in a contractor's business. Hi, hey, Patricia. We're trying to train for core technologies, right? We're trying to, to give them the big picture and then deep dive where it's appropriate. But, you know, we're really trying to, um, to gather in entry-level people. And, you know, part of the training is going to be to kind of help them see what, what a potential uh, career path for them might be, right? What their interests are, what their aptitude is, right? And, and, and in the training, kind of identify those things to help assist contractors in, in training uh, or identifying, you know, who, who's the right candidate for me. But I also have an additional bonus fun tip for anybody who's interested in podcasts. I just discovered this. It's a podcast called Building HVAC Science. And, and the guy who does it is all about high performance contracting and, and figuring out how mechanical contractors can mesh with building envelope contractors or, you know, do both. It is awesome, deep, relevant content. Uh, you know, I'm just geeking out on it this week. I just discovered it. So I have no connection whatsoever to this person. His name is Bill Spohn, S-P-O-H-N. But it's, I'll put it in the chat. Building HVAC Science is the podcast. Awesome. And um, if you have, one of the things that we, we make, make this announcement about um, connecting these students with the contractors, please put, if you're interested in getting in, 
in the program, you'd have to sign up. We're going to figure out how you want to connect. You know, if that's an informational interview early on that would keep them motivated and going through more advanced heat pump training, that's something that we want to work with the hiring managers on. So please put your name of your company in a contact um, if you would like to sign up and we'll circle back with you and get started and send you an email about it. Next, we have our um, the heat pump forecast um, group. We have an update. We thought we were going to be able to meet with RMI before this meeting and have more feedback and more information, but I have some slides on that. We'll talk about that. Then we're going to jump into um, the regulatory update, what's happening with um, Excel Energy, the schedule that's coming up, and we have Dietz and Davis and um, Howard to talk about that, and also um, Howard did a deep dive into the DSM plan for 2023 and listed out uh, the different industries and pages so that you guys can start to dig into that. So we're going to walk through that next. And so first off, um, just a quick high level overview to remind everybody what the action committee does and the policy action committee does as well, um, is that we have a lot that's happening on our plate in 2022 that's setting the stage for the next two and five years. And, um, you know, we're a strong partner with Excel. Um, in delivering the programs, doing the market development. And so um, this group has been working on some pieces to help inform the strategic issues and the goal setting. And so I've listed here um, the 2022 strategic issues and then also the 2023 DSM plan. Um, that's an extension plan, those were filed in July. And um, right now, the next step for our group is to look at what's in the DSM plan for 2023 and um, look at the rebates. Are they sufficient? Where um, are there any modifications that our, our group would like to see? And in March, I've listed here, we talked about the heat pump acceleration forecast, how many heat pumps do we need by 2030? That's really to set the um, expectations and the strategic issues the next five years of planning and saying, okay, how many do we really need to hit the goals between the cities, the greenhouse gas plan from Colorado Energy Office, the legislation with the clean heat um, goals, and then what are Excel's goals? And so um, that's what the ad hoc uh, heat pump action group has been working on. And then we've been talking about EAR and Excel made a nice move in some of the EAR uh, levels uh, to make more of the heat pumps uh, eligible for rebates. And then we've had some discussion about refrigerants, how much training, what needs to happen in that area. And um, with that, this is my space for Howard Geller and um, Casey from Dietz and Davis to they're both our council and working in intervening and they're gonna talk about the schedule um, and uh, what it looks like so that we know about deadlines and how this process works to submit proposals from this group. And I don't know, Howard or Casey, who would like to go first? I don't have a preference, Howard. If you want to go first, I, I can go second. Either way, um, I think you're going to talk about schedule more, and I'm going to start to talk a little bit about substance. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to, I'll kind of, yeah, kick it off with the scheduling and the logistics. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Patricia said, my name's Casey. I work at the law for a law firm in Boulder called Dietz and Davis. Um, and we've been working with EBC over the years on these DSM plans. Um, and so I'm just gonna give a little update. Um, as of yesterday, EBC's two permissive interventions were granted um, by the commission. So EBC intervened into the 2023 DSM plan. 
Um, and then also the, the DSM, and I should also say it's a DSM beneficial electrification plan, which the company was required to file um, in light of recent changes in Colorado law. So it's a combined BE DSM plan. Um, and then the company also filed its strategic issues filing, and that's kind of set the tone for future DSM and BE plans in the um, 2024 to 2027 period. Um, so in the next few years. So, oh, go ahead, Patricia. Could I add really quick? So yeah. some of our um, companies are not familiar with the legal term DSM and that the demand side management acronym is really the name of the rebate programs that Excel offers. Is that how you'd explain it? Yeah, and I can actually, I'm just pulling up my, my notes, I can give a nice little overview of these kinds of concepts if it would be, it would be helpful because it's kind of, the company does a nice job of laying it out um, in their testimony since we now have the BE concept in there as well. So I apologize for my <laughs> email noises, um, but my notes are, are in here. So, um, so demand side management, it's an umbrella term and refers to the modification of customer demand for energy, whether electric or gas. And DSM includes multiple components or subsets of activities, including energy efficiency, load management, demand response, and, and conservation. And then a couple other just high level concepts. Um, energy efficiency generally refers to a customer using less energy to perform the same task or shifting energy use to off peak times when the cost of service may be less. Um, whereas demand response refers to any reactive or preventative method to reduce system um, peak demand. And demand response can include dispatchable and non-dispatchable methods to alter the timing or level of end use customers demand for electricity. And then um, beneficial electrification, which is this new, you know, um, newer concept that's being integrated into these you know, DSM plans. Um, it refers to converting a customer's end use from a non-electric fuel source to a high efficiency electric source or um, avoiding the use of non-electric fuel sources in new construction and industrial applications. And this conversion is conceived of as beneficial because it is intended to lower overall greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the switch um, to the use of a fossil fuel to an increasingly carbon-free electricity. Um, so, and by law, Colorado requires to, for something to qualify as BE, the end result of the conversion or, or, or avoidance must be um, to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions over the lifetime of the conversion um, and either reduce societal costs or provide a more efficient use of the grid resources. Um, so those are kind of the high level concepts as we're moving through these two plans. Um, that I'd be happy to provide those definitions to anyone in the chat um, as well. But um, so yesterday the commission approved EBC's intervention in these two plans, the strategic issues plan and the 2023 plan. So the parties to the strategic issues um, docket include um, the three kind of governmental entities and that's the utility consumer advocate, um, staff of the commission and the Colorado Energy Office. Um, and then in terms of municipalities, the city and county of um, Denver had intervened and now they're in the case along with the city of Boulder. Uh, and then there's also the Colorado Energy Consumers, um, Climax, which is a mining company, um, Sierra Club and NRDC, who are gonna be referred to as the Conservation Coalition. Then we also have CRESS, the Colorado Renewable Energy Society, um, Energy Outreach Colorado, who's an EEBC member, um, SWEEP, and uh, Western Resource Advocates. Um, so those are, and largely those are the same parties in the 2023 plan, um, with the exception of um, Iconergy, who I believe is also an EBC member, and they there were also granted intervention um, in the 2023 plan. And so what's interesting with these two plans, the commission is actually gonna hear both of these proceedings on Bonk which means instead of referring it to an administrative law judge, like um, the commission did for the 2020, uh, 2021 to 2022 plan that EBC was most recently involved in, um, these, these are gonna stay with the three commissioners. So they're gonna be you know, presiding over the case and um, making rulings in the first instance, as opposed to um, an administrative law judge hearing, hearing the case. 
And um, because the commission is keeping both these cases instead of referring one or both out, um, the company will be reaching out to all the parties for input on how to space these two, um, these two proceedings since you know the hearings can't be set at the same time and all of the deadlines just because the parties are are pretty much the same so we should be hearing back from um from the company i think by the end of next week on a proposed procedural schedule for both and i think that will kind of dictate when ebc members want to put their proposals get their proposals in to us to start to review and get that to the company um because an interesting issue that came up yesterday at the commission weekly meeting is um, that you know, the commission's really interested to learn about how the Inflation Reduction Act, which was recently passed, um, how that's going to affect these DSM plans. And so they're, they might be ordering supplemental direct testimony um, to the company. So that means, um, so when the company filed their, their plan, which, I've, um, which we're going to, I think, go over a little bit, they also file supporting test, written testimony for their, from their company witnesses. And so sometimes the commission will order supplemental, like additional testimony on certain topics. And in this case, it looks like they're going to be ordering supplemental direct about the implications of the Inflation Reduction Act and how that might affect the plan since it was, since the, um, the act was, you know, signed into law prior to this or after this case was filed. Um, so I think the commission's interested to see how that might change the plan and um, so that's something we want to be paying attention to um, as this moves forward. But um, as of right now, EBC's interventions have been have been granted, and we expect um, settlement, a preliminary settlement discussions to happen for the 2023 plan pretty quickly. But that just might be dictated by um, this issue of supplemental direct, with the commission's going to take up next Wednesday, uh, and a procedural schedule though for both cases is due next Friday, the 9th, and so. I think we'll quickly be in a position to see what the schedule is going to be, and that will kind of dictate when these settlement discussions will be happening, and and, and in a turn when these settlement proposals and ideas from from the membership might be um, required. And quick thing, when when you're saying the company that actually is Excel, because Excel yes. <laughs> legal name is public. Uh, Public company. Service Company of Colorado. In Colorado. So we say company all the time. It, it's actually Excel Energy in the PUC, but Excel Energy is in the process. Yeah. Um, so I think the really important point of that is by the end of September, like this group will need to have, and each company who's planning on putting together um, a specific proposal for different rebates um, and collectively as a group all agreeing on the ones that we want to um, put forth together or really do at the end of September. Is that right? Well, we don't really know quite yet. I mean, that's, yeah. if there is supplemental direct testimony, then it won't be the end of September. This, the settlement discussions, I think, would be pushed into October. Um, it'll, it'll take, you know, a couple of weeks Companies and, will have maybe, you know, two weeks to turn in that supplemental testimony and that will, um, push so back the schedule. There's yeah. all the interveners now get to submit questions, which is, you know, called discovery. Um, and so there needs to be time to submit questions and get responses to questions. Um, and so if there is supplemental testimony, there will need to be some time allowed for questions, discovery questions and responses on the supplemental testimony prior to settlement discussions beginning. So with a little luck, there'll be some the supplemental testimony and a bit more time but you know, it's not going to be pushed to November or December. It, all likelihood, we'd be looking at maybe middle of October for an you know initial meeting to get the recommendations from the interveners as to what changes they would like to propose, and then Excel will mull those over and get back to the group. There will be a series of meetings. The history here is that. All previous DSM plans have 
resulted in settlement agreements as opposed to a, a litigated adversarial hearing where different parties present views and proposals and uh, the commission decides which of those proposals to, to accept and which to reject in, in a hearing that's contentious. Uh, the DSM strategic issues docket, which happens once every four or five years, that's a docket that's setting high level policies like future savings targets. It will set in this case, future beneficial electrification targets, future being like the five year period starting in 2024. Um, other high level policies like the financial incentive mechanism that offers the company an opportunity to earn a, a bonus if they perform well in implementing these programs. That's kind of one of the issues, one of the important issues in that docket. Those high level policies will get set for programs starting in 2024 and, and future DSM plans uh, will, will be submitted under those policies. Um, and all, all previous strategic issues dockets have not reached a settlement uh, of all the parties. There's, there was a partial settlement among some of the parties in the last case, which the commission rejected in large part but there's never been a full settlement that all the parties support in DSM strategic issues. So the expectation is that, that there will be testimony and rebuttal testimony and a hearing where witnesses submitting testimony get cross-examined and then a commission decision. And that, that docket will, if it proceeds in that manner, will take many months. And, the hearing potentially could be in December or January, maybe even February, depending on um, what's being requested in supplemental testimony, how busy the commission is. Um, but we'll, we'll be setting that schedule here as well as the schedule for the DSM plan, this 2023 one-year extension. Um, but I, in our mind, the, the priority right now is to focus on the 2023 DSM plan and try to get some consensus about what short list of high priority changes the EEBC would like to request in this docket. By the way, I should have started with an introduction. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Howard Geller. And at this time, I've under contract to be the expert witness for EEBC in both of these dockets, working with all of you to come up with proposals and testimony. As some of you know, I previously was the executive director of SWEEP and SWEEP's expert witness in all of these previous dockets. Uh, but as of February of last year, I stepped down as SWEEP's executive director. I'm partially retired and part-time consultant and pleased to be working with EEBC, which is an organization I helped to found about 15 years ago. Um, so that's my role here is to take the lead on writing any testimony and working with all of you and with Dietz and Davis on settlement ne negotiations uh, for the 2023 plan docket. Great. You know, and I'd be happy to start talking a little bit about some of the substance of the 23 plan with respect to heat pumps, if there's time and a desire to do that. Yeah, I think that um, 
just to frame up what the group here needs to do is not yeah. just come in and listen to right. what's happening is that this is when we all have to get in action and dig into the sections on, like you're saying, HVAC and heat pump mm -hmm. and um, looking at the goal that's going to be set like you talk about the floor, you know, that Excel has to say, okay, the total budget is a hundred million and it has to stay at that. They can't drop it over the next five years. And then the question I think that we can be very helpful with is the number of heat pumps that need to be installed. So we're forecasting that so that we can say to actually install that many, what does our contractors, manufacturers, and distributors right. need to make sure happen? Is that a midstream rebate? Is that, um, does that mean that there has to be additional consumer education and that we are asking for, make sure that the budget's large enough to make sure that's there for the 2023 and then the 24, 25 plan that'll be worked on next year. And, um, you know, that's where we have to dig into beneficial yep. electrification that's talked about in the plan. So I want to make sure that when we know that, for instance, like you're saying, Howard, that the proposals would be due late October, it generally companies, you guys need more time than a week or two to turn it around because you have to put all the analytics in and, and all the, um, everything that they need for their evaluation of the the TRC. So that's where we have to have more frequent meetings. Um, I and how we'll work with you individually to pull those together in the right format. And we've learned in the past that EBC has been very successful in the last 20, uh, 220 or 21-22 plan with 16 proposals that we put in and um, we got 13 of those. And I think that the feedback from Excel is that because we organize every one of our program proposals in the same categories, saying here's the current cost, here's our recommendation, here's the market conditions, this is how much it'll move the market. That's what um, we have a step-by-step -step in that information for each one of your companies to work on that. And then there are the general ones that we all agree to proposal-wise that Howard that I think you'll be driving a lot of those as a group saying 21 companies are supporting this and putting input in for it. Is that's kind of our role as we're working in tandem with Dietz and Davis and with right. our. Hey, Patricia, can I just ask one clip mm -hmm. procedural question here before yeah. we talk a little bit more about what Excel has proposed in this area and what sort of responses the EBC might put forward. Let me ask if anyone from Excel is on this call. No, Anne actually, and I already talked and she dropped off. Okay, good. Good question. <laughs> yes, great. If we're gonna start critiquing their plan, this is- Yeah. Should not be shared with Excel. Exactly. Obviously, you can talk to other people in your company and talk across company <laughs> companies that are members here, but we should keep this to ourselves. And yeah, um, we used to when we had the meetings in person. You know, Excel would be there for some of the discussion, then we'd ask them to leave the room. It's a little right. bit different on Zoom, you know, right. managing that. So I did right. ping Anne, and she right. said, no "Problem, thanks," and jumped off. So I've done a review of the plan here recently and drafted an initial memo of areas that I think are weak, where there could be improvements across the whole plan, not just related to heat pumps and beneficial electrification, and shared that with um, Patricia just earlier this week and, and Dietz and Davis. And um, so I think at least the sections that are relevant to heat pumps would be good for, for people to look at. And in that memo, I referred to the pages in the plan for 
you know, each section where I have comments. And my comments with respect to heat pumps are, of course, in the HVAC program, the residential HVAC program. What Excel calls these products. I think we generally call them programs where you know, they're, they're housing their heat pump incentives for air source heat pumps, mini split heat pumps, also heat pump water heaters. They're all housed in that program, at least for the residential sector. But I have a number of other thoughts about where there could be more focus on heat pumps, such as in the Energy Star New Homes program, that's the residential new construction incentive program. They have a multifamily housing program. They have um, a business HVAC program where in these other programs, they give very little uh, attention to the role that heat pumps could play. Um, so I think we want to look across a number of programs for how there could be greater support for heat pumps, both in terms of incentives and promotion and market development, not just in the residential HVAC program. But very quickly, in my view, the, the incentives they're proposing for air source heat pumps and mini split heat pumps for the residential sector are now 1,500 to $2,000 per unit. And that's considerably more than they started out with about a year ago. They've increased the, the incentives considerably and proposed continuing the incentives at that level. And in light of the, the further incentives from the Inflation Reduction Act, the tax credits and potential grants that will be flowing through state energy offices. There's going to be a lot of money on the table in the way of incentive dollars for customers purchasing heat pumps. Um, what struck me as being very modest, that's about the nicest way I could put it, is their targets for the number of heat pump installations in 2023, considering their incentives, all the other efforts in the state from Denver's efforts, the Beneficial Electrification League, all the market development work that you all are involved in, and then these new federal incentives. Um, the, the targets are installation of 165 air source heat pumps and 765 mini split heat pumps. That's the totals in those areas. They have that broken out between different combinations like air, you know, air source heat pumps and without a backup furnace, air source heat pumps with a backup furnace, et cetera. But those are the totals um, and my reaction is that those are wimpy targets, but of course I'd like to hear from all of you as to, do you also agree that they're wimpy targets? And, and if so, can we reach some agreement here as to what we would offer as alternative targets? Hey, Howard, this is Jesse here uh, with Hercules. Can you give those numbers again? What, the, what were those targets? Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed it. And obviously we don't have time now to fully flesh this out. I'm just putting some issues on the table for you all to mull over as you look at my memo and look at the section in the plan. The targets are 165 air source heat pumps in residential, you know, in the residential sector and 765 mini split heat pumps. And those could be, you know, a simple one outlet mini split for someone's, you know, master bedroom or a whole house, you know, multi multi outlet mini split. Yeah, that, that 165, that 165 seems extremely low to me. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. the, and, the, and the mini split seems a little bit inflated, but 
that's just me. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So I'm going to add to that really quick. This is where I think the heat pump action, the ad hoc group that's been working on how many heat pumps need to be installed by 2030 has built a baseline of looking at the last 20 years and then also 2019-2021 and looking at the trajectory. And so I don't know if you guys want to comment, but the next meeting, I think we should probably schedule here in September right. because we're working on that. And this should be a part of that discussion to break it down. Right. Yeah. Um, Patricia, I'll, I'll make a quick comment and then I'd like to hand it over to Adam because he had some, uh, it looks like he has something to share as well. But just real quick, Howard, I think those, and for the, for the room, um, I think those low numbers, you described them as wimpy and I would agree um, that those numbers are based on the fact that they didn't have much uptake, right? And so when, um, uh, you know, most contractors, when the rebates are low, they'd rather buy down the purchase, if you will, right? All right, I'll just offer you the discount, 300 bucks, 350 bucks, 500 bucks. I'll offer you the discount for the sale today, understandably, and they want to close the deal uh, because it's easier for them to absorb that cost than to deal with the, the paperwork, the hassles, depends on the jurisdiction, of course. Boulder being, uh, um, um, you know, renowned for more <laughs> complex rebate paperwork um, and Excel being, um, frankly, more renowned for pretty straightforward paperwork, but it's still an extra task. It's still in right. the way, if you will, right? And so with that, those, those numbers being low in Excel's experience and those numbers forecasted being extraordinarily low compared to what the growth of the market uh, will be based on some some approximations and rough numbers that we've looked at. And I'll hand it over to Adam for additional thought. Uh, before I dive into that, Howard, is there are there numbers on gas furnaces? How many they're planning to rebate there? Yes. It's like 5,000, 6,000. Wow. So <laughs> With, I, I, you know, with their modest, like $200. Wow. Rebate. I, was I mean, if they were, what, what was that, Rob? I said, I was hoping you were going to say four. Well, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, that's exactly my point. Um, NYSERDA, I spent a lot of time working with New York State, and, and NYSERDA is completely stopping incentives for gas furnaces. Right. Like, you can't. Get, like, they're not doing rebates anymore. That's what you guys should be advocating for get rid of the fossil fuel rebates completely and put all of that money towards heat pumps. I mean, NYSERDA's target is 100,000 heat pumps a year for the state. It's a little bit more populous state, but they got to do 3 million homes over 10 years. That's their target, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's so, true. <laughs> I would so 700, like, come on, like, that's crazy. Um, I think we're going to see other interveners push for ending rebates on gas furnaces and yeah. gas water heaters and yeah. EBC can we do wants that? to join. We, we can try, you know, that there's no guarantee this is going to be a negotiation, a settlement, you know, or recommendations where there needs to be a consensus that Excel is going to have to agree to, you know, if it, we're not going to get everything that we ask for. Um, and I think I just fully expect that the city of Denver and the environmental groups are going to strongly advocate for ending incentives on gas furnaces and gas water heaters starting next year, not five years from now. And um, you know, EEBC will have a seat at the table and a vote and, and getting behind that as, as an industry group, I think could be quite powerful in terms of this isn't just, you know, the Sierra Club and the city of Denver, but the, the, or, the state organization representing manufacturers, distributors and contractors is, is behind it. And, put that money into doing more heat pumps and more market development and more support for heat pumps. Yeah, and, so and I, go ahead, Patricia. I was just gonna add, so realize the EBC, we are the business voice of energy efficiency. And so we have to 
balance and look at the collective of what we um, want to go to the table with that Howard is talking about. And the thing that I think we have to take into consideration is, you know, EBC was built on energy efficiency rebates for gas and electric, you know, before beneficial electrification came along. So I think that we have manufacturers and, you know, going, okay, is it dual fuel more reasonable for, and for how long? And then when do we see the switch? And then looking, I think what the forecasting group is trying to do is look at hard data to look at those inflection points and when it is possible and how many heat pumps it would take to, I'll, I'll, you guys can say it much better than me, but three things. Um, what's the inflection point for replacing air conditioners, you know, with heat pumps? Like, is that a first priority focus, which I saw, you know, mentioned in, in by Eric Wilson and others in the chat box? You know, then um, at what point is it, you know, just replacing, um, and then when do you hit 100% gas? And you know, the whole piece is in there actually looking at a trajectory line for Colorado by 2030 so that we can come in with solid data and also get maybe some consensus. Howard will be meeting with the other um, organizations that are intervening and influencing them so that we don't give just a lot of different numbers from all these organizations and the PUC picks one that we all disagree with. Like if we can get more um, buy-in and more shared agreement between all the groups, we're more likely to settle without going into a full litigation. So that's some of the challenges that the group has to think about here and work through. It, right. Yeah, just to you know, put out put out these issues. I think we're we're going to need to look at the installation targets, obviously, and. And, and and think about them in light of the ARA dollars, as you know, a couple of people in the chat have said that that those could be game changing type incentives. We need to look at the Excel's rebate levels and decide whether we want to try to get any modifications in the in, in the rebate levels from Excel and. The other related activities, you know, are there some, given their how they're running their residential HVAC program today, do we want to try to get some commitments from them to do more training or more market support? I think one area would be for, for them to commit to doing a lot of education about the IRA incentives with contractors and with customers because you know, the U.S. Department of Energy is not going to be on the ground in Denver and, and Aurora and Broomfield doing that. If, you know, Excel's out there promoting heat pumps and promoting their incentives, they should be providing just as much information and education on the federal incentives as well. And at least in my view, that they're going to be a primary conduit for building awareness. Howard, I wonder. Sure, on... This is Robert. Oh, good. Yeah, I was just gonna say this, this is Robert. Um, I, I'm wondering, I mean, if if Excel does not uh, feel that they can back away from furnace rebates uh, totally, would there be maybe a, a happy medium approach to say that, okay, well, what happens if they only provided rebates on furnaces that were used in the hybrid or the dual fuel systems right? so that they would be adding a heat pump as well as a furnace and then they could provide the rebates for the furnaces. So they'd still be providing some rebates for furnaces, yeah. but the focus would be on heat pumps. Yeah, those are, you know, that's an excellent suggestion in my view and the kind of creative thinking that hopefully we can bring the tape the, to the table here. And also, you know, we can get, you know, if some of the interveners are gonna make a big stink about continuing furnace incentives, we also could get potentially an agreement that, okay, they're gonna continue for one more year, but we would agree now that in the next plan, <laughs> which we're gonna see a year from now, right, for 2024, 25 programs, 
you know, they'll end those incentives so that we're kind of winding down um, and, and potentially doing what Robert suggested as yeah. well. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead, Adam. I was well, just going to say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> say, the great news is these IRA incentives are so phenomenal that for the first time ever, we can ignore utility rebates. It doesn't matter. There's such yes. a nothing compared to the tax credits in this IRA yes. bill, right? That's what we need to be wrapping our heads around is how do we effectively take that tool and use it to implement heat pump, in, heat pump installation, irregardless of what Excel's doing. Yeah, I've got, I've got two points on Next. this concept. And one is, that for the longest time, when I run the models for Colorado, heat pumps just never made sense by themselves, right? Just from an economic standpoint. Um, that was with 70 cents a therm gas and 12 cents a kilowatt hour electricity. But I just looked up the rates and it's been a while. I, I since moved to Florida, so sorry, I'm not paying the gas bills anymore in Colorado. But I looked up the rates the other day and it's $1.17 a therm for natural gas. I plugged that number into our modeling and it's completely flipped. It is massively cheaper to operate a heat pump in Colorado now than yeah. it is to run a gas furnace. That's right. completely upside down. So as long as gas doesn't go way back down again, maybe it can, I don't know like what the future holds there, but at these rates, it's that game's over. There's no point in installing gas equipment anymore. Right. It just isn't. Other than the concern on grid at peak, at the coldest temperatures, right? So unless you're doing a hyperheat, super cold climate system that can really handle the polar vortexes um, and, and not have to switch to electric resistance as much, you know, we have to look at winter peak as a really important piece of that puzzle. But other than that, you really don't have an excuse to keep subsidizing gas. It just, it doesn't make any sense. Right. I agree with Rob completely on why are we even trying to do heat pump incentives when the IRA's incentives are gonna be incredible. And so there's, there's, there's a really good point there. And with Howard's thoughts of, can we move the money more towards education and contractor training perhaps, but here's a really, really important thing that I've been preaching about for a while now is if you just do electrification without anything else it's gonna backfire the industry is gonna just it's they're really gonna be hurting because people are gonna be installing heat pumps in houses that aren't insulated enough to to support them and you're gonna have all kinds of really crazy stuff going on and it's gonna be like jimmy carter days of solar thermal panels going on the roof and everybody like look, these things don't work like you know bad installation all kinds of problems right so i think it's absolutely crucial that we're thinking whole house like ho the home performance concept is way more important now than it used to be right and instead of the home performance where we're like oh let's make sure we've got cas testing so that we deal with the combustion appliances and that ventilation um we're getting rid of combustion appliances entirely so we don't have to worry about CAS testing anymore. Let's electrify, but you've got to get the envelope right. You've got to get the air quality right, the ventilation right. All that has to be done right. And ideally size the matching solar systems to help with those loads and help bring those electric costs down. So whole house, complete deep energy retrofit packages is where we need to be thinking. The kind of stuff that Helio Home is doing here. I saw them chatting in. Um, you know, that is where the future is, right. and we have to think holistically. So yeah. if there's any way in our intervention to say, hey, don't just throw, you know, throw heat pumps at the wall and hope they stick, <laughs> like, we've right. got to do uh, the, the whole house and focus right. on that. Right. Yeah, they have their traditional insulation and air sealing program with very modest incentives. And they have a new whole house efficiency program, okay. which is trying to get at whole house efficiency 
it's basically trying to get customers to do multiple uh, retrofits, multiple yeah. measures with prescriptive incentives for different measures. It's, it's not very creative. Mm -hmm. And one thought I had there was, okay, offer the prescriptive incentives, but also really work on whole home performance aligned with what's in IRA for whole house and exactly. The, exactly, which is the percentage reduction in total energy use approach that's in uh, hope for the hope for homes component of IRA, and exactly. and promote that and promote the IRA incentives and add add some some utility dollars, add you know a thousand bucks or whatever for that 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 comprehensive whole house and. Just to okay. let everybody know, we are at the top of the hour. I, it goes fast. Maybe these need right. to be longer as we dip, dive into these. Um, I just want to remind everybody, if somebody's dropping off, we don't mind staying for some additional time to talk about this. And um, we typically will have kind of more conversation afterwards like that. But the quarterly membership meeting is on the 15th. And um, we have... Uh, Michael Gifford from the Association of General Contractors talking about the workforce pipeline, where we're at in Colorado right now. Then we have um, two of our kind of legacy builders of Colorado, Thrive Homes uh, builders, as well as Nick Stain, um, talking from the perspective of what they need from a contractor that's different when they went to net zero and electrification and, um, and that high performance side. and what they're looking for to hire someone to keep them, um, to help them hit their numbers on their uh, their homes. And then um, uh, then we were gonna do, you know, more update on what we're doing here, but for all the industries. And just so you know, having to look into starting an insulation, air sealing, shell envelope group, maybe it should be whole home, I don't know. Now I'm listening to this, but, the point is we need the insulation manufacturers and companies now to align with what we're talking about and increase the incentives on that side as well, yep. based on what's in IRA. So that's kind of how we operate. Um, so anybody, Can I just conclude to yes. the yep. concluding comment? Once again, I, you know, I urge people to look at the memo, the sections in my memo that you're you're interested in and the sections in the plan that you're interested in. And I've provided the page numbers. I also note at the top of my memo, the details about the numbers, the rebate amounts, the target installation amounts, measure by measure, are in a five page table at the back of the plan. I note the page numbers, pages 493 through 498. So look at that table as well as the write-ups on each of the programs and, and um, start to, you know, come up with recommendations to bring the future meetings or put them in writing and share, share them with everybody in the group. Awesome. Yeah. Howard, thank you for doing that because we all don't want to start with a 500 page document and dive into it. So um, to help with that, we took excerpts that Howard identified. So we put those in little PDFs for you. And then also that, that chart you're talking about with a table. Table. Um, so we're gonna send out, uh, it's gonna have a couple things. It's gonna have invites to the Denver meeting, the quarterly membership meeting, good green job signups, and then the memo that Howard provide to us with those excerpts there. So if you need to read further, you know where to start and you can do that quick high level with the memo and with those excerpts to get you yeah. out of the box and going. And one last thing, I mentioned this earlier. If you have time, look beyond just the residential HVAC program and yeah. think about how to appropriately insert support for heat pumps in the multifamily housing program, in the small business program, in the residential new construction program, and any other program where you think there yeah. could be a, a, a role for heat pumps. Howard, when you say multifamily, is there actually 
commercial reference to? Should we be looking at that, or is it covered in my memo? Considered commercial lot, but within the residential sector, there's a multifamily buildings program, and my memo has the page numbers for that write up, and okay, that's separate from their their commercial HVAC program and okay. other commercial programs. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Um, oh, or do you want Jonathan's to got his hand up. Yeah. Jonathan? Or not. <laughs> uh, Howard, this is Sam Beeson. Um, Hi, Sam. Quick question on the, since they've, it seems like an artificially low number for total heat pump installations in the plan, is, is there a reason that Excel, are they moving money in other areas they feel is more important, or is it just purely because they had low uptake in the last cycle? Um, and if, because yeah, $1,500 uh, is enough for contractors to get interested to probably do the paperwork, if we blew the numbers out in 23, would, would they have? keep funding the program or would we just be out of money? So I think the their targets are primarily based on what they've seen, what they saw last year and what they're seeing, you know, so far in the first half of this year, they filed this plan July 1st. And so these are, you know, higher numbers than the uptake last year, but they're they're not ready to take the leap that they, you know, we can increase by a factor of 10 from 21 to 23, something like that. So that's, I think they're just looking at the uptake and um, if we can, you know, they don't stop incentives after 165, if 165 is their target, they will keep providing you know the incentives and they they usually have some cushion and they get an approved overall budget that's more than they're going to spend and they have an extra half a million or million dollars and they can move money around between programs there will be under underperforming programs that don't hit their targets and other programs that blow the targets out of the water that happens every year. And they move the money around so that they're not stopping incentives in you know, September or October and leaving the contractors high and dry um, if they're you know, in the middle of a closing a deal. <laughs> you know, that it would be disastrous for Excel to say, sorry, you know, come back in January. <laughs> so I think we can try to get the targets increased and even in, you know an implementation work on getting uh, act, you know actual installations that that far exceed whatever whatever targets we end up with is there any bearing on from just feedback from our group that if there are 20 I'll just say like I've heard everywhere from 10 to 20,000 heat pumps being installed annually in Colorado but Excel's only get, like basically out of the uh, utility, the 40 something utilities, literally I estimate there's only been 2000 rebates a year between all the utilities. Like, and so um, what benefit is there if the market's moving without the rebates is, do we want them to increase their rebates to capture that because they need to show that to get their, their incentive, you know, get their TRC incentives reached or did this skimming a little bit off enough? Like, is there something that I don't understand about, you know, if there's 5,000 gas um, rebates process annually, which that's about what it is, um, mm -hmm. then what benefit is there? There's nine, Excel has 900, heat pump contractor, or excuse me, HVAC contractors of that group, you know, there's only 
5,000 Dunier and gas, it's still really low. But Excel would say that that was a um, you know landmark. Right. Of course. Number. So how does that fit with heat pumps if there's? Right. They're only rebating you know 95% AFUE furnaces. So it's of course not all furnaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, are the heat pump total heat pump installations in Colorado really 20,000 a year? That's Patri yeah, Patricia, I think Sean said it earlier where the incentive wasn't enough for the contractor to spend the time and the effort to employ someone to go back and get that rebate. They'll right. just crank up the price, they'll knock off that rebate and they'll move on. That's actually easier right. for them. But if there's more incentive, then yes, they'll jump on board. And if with the Inflation Act, they add on top of that, you're going to see heat pumps just take off. Right. But it is, we kind of, when we looked at what we thought was happening in the state, we think oh. it is around 10,000 being installed. 10,000. Well, the, well the other way, just to, ahead. sorry, just to finish that piece up, clip, point of clarification, uh, the 20,000 was across all heat pumps. So that's like standard, yeah. single speed, two speed, high, inverter based, et cetera, and so on. When you look at the inverter based, I would say, you know, uh, I would, I would say that Mitsubishi is in many multiples, multiple thousands uh, per year. Great. So uh, here's a here's a question, Howard. Um, d this is a demand side management program, right? Yeah. And if you, you know, if you're going to get a whole bunch more heat pumps in the system and on the grid because well, the IRA, you know, all the incentives and rebates are going to push it there. How, you know, you're going to actually be increasing kilowatt hour demand on the grid. However, um, so in order to do demand side management, focusing on electricity, wouldn't it make sense to focus on air sealing and insulation so that you can bring the loads down that those heat yeah. pumps are now trying to heat in the winter? Right. Right. Like yes. if you really like that, I think it's just I keep hitting it. But like heat yeah. pumps are going, this is going to happen. We're already there. Like the, the, it, it's going to happen. But we if they really want it, it before, if you did air sealing and insulation, it wouldn't have much of an effect on demand. A little bit of cooling you'd save. Right. But right. now we're talking winter peak. And yeah. so the amount of effect you can have by dropping your load 20,000 BTUs an hour is massive on that peak for a heat pump. Mm -hmm. So yeah, especially if it goes into electric resistance mode. And and so right. we can model all that. And I don't know if it helps to do some large scale modeling in order to um, you know do, do that analysis, but that's stuff that we can help do. So yeah. we wanna look at those numbers. Yeah, and I think in the short term, you know, there's still a summer peaking utility, you know, their heat pumps are largely filling troughs yeah. In, the, in the winter and you know you're not getting 10 of them on a you know on one street so that the that that distribution feeders start to get overloaded right. um it's going to take many years to build up that that concentration and mm -hmm. penetration so well just a reminder that if but I you're have... right i mean it doesn't make sense to put a very sophisticated inverter based cold climate heat pump in some poorly insulated leaky house <laughs> right but just but just a, just as a reminder if a house has air conditioning it probably has enough um, breaker panel capability and distribution uh, neighborhood uh, power distribution to handle the heat pump loads because yeah. it's 97 degrees outside and that all those air conditioners are on the grid can handle it in that neighborhood period right yeah good point yeah i mean cadmus did a study for new york that said um how many heat pumps can we switch to before the winter peak happens instead of summer peak like before it becomes a winter peak and it's about 50 percent. so you can you can switch over 50 percent of the homes before the grid flips to a winter peak and that's that's new york so colorado is a little different because you don't have as much cooling as new york does but maybe we do now <laughs> Thanks, oh, so, so my take on that is that of all the problems we've got to solve, the grid is not one of them. That's Excel's problem, right? And they got fantastic engineers to solve that problem. 
and you know EVs compound it and EV charging stations for semis make it a monster problem, but that's not our problem. Our problem is selling heat pumps. <laughs> here, here, that's, I echo that one, nice point. Jonathan, did you have a comment earlier? It sounded like you had your hand raised. Yeah, I did. I wanted to ask, it, it's um, um, Mr. Geller. I can't remember his name, first name, and it's not coming up on my screen. It's Howard. Thank you, Howard. Um, I thought, I'm just so thankful that you're in the mix here. This is, it's really exciting to have all your, your experience and work. And, you know, putting my, my hat on as a like inverter heat pump um, enthusiast, I think what we see with Excel's goals that they set is that they're still struggling to deal with EER and give enough qualified products um, so that, and, and I believe that that's preventing them from seeing rebates come in today uh, and, and recent period. And so I wondered, based on your experience, could we put in a, a comment or a request that we want Excel to invest in research that supports an inverter as a solution for peak demand. I don't, I might not be phrasing it the best way, but can we ask them to do the research to, to yes. show an inverter as benefits EER? Yeah, they have research, sense. they have a pot of money for research. And we can also put in requests for tweaking the qualification levels. You know, they've made some movement on EER, but if we, as a group, think they, they haven't gone far enough, this is this is the time. To well, and that is we to raise met, that issue. Yeah, yeah, we met with them on the EER, and they basically said we don't have time. Um, they made that small move. That move that they made, and they're not on the phone, was not because our group spent all that time meeting with them and talking through it. By spending that time with them, they realized they were using the wrong baseline for ear. And so that they were using a heat pump as the baseline instead of um, the AC, I think, or something like that. And so they made that small move, which was an appeasement to all of us and got some of your equipment eligible. But then they're like, well, if you guys can do bring to us examples from other utilities and stuff, then we will look at it but this is a legal process. We can require them to look at it now, like you're saying, Jonathan, which is right. you know, what we do is when they don't, when we have the nice conversations yeah. and we do the work and we don't get enough movement, then we right. can do it. They, they, want to settle it. they want to get the, these DSM plans settled. They don't want to be in front of the commission defending every little technical assumption in the 550-page mm -hmm. plan. <laughs> so they... They want to get as many groups as possible on board with the plan, and they know they have to make some accommodations. Um, so this is this this is the opportunity to raise those kinds of issues about details on qualification levels, rebate amounts, dollars I, I for think, education. I think it's a so critical, Howard, because of a couple little nuanced reasons that I think the, uh, the few of us remaining on the call will really, I hope, resonate with. Um, the criteria that the you know new tax credit, the Inflation Reduction Act stipulated tax credit, the, the equipment requirements for that are actually pretty high. You know, the brand that I know best is Daikin, and we have all but you know, only really the top, if highest qual, uh, highest dollar products will qualify for that tax credit. Now, in a case of Daikin, we for the rebate that's stipulated today, we don't have a lot of products that would qualify for that, just because it requires a certification of, of Energy Star, which we just never invested in. Um, and then simultaneously to that, I don't believe the Colorado Energy Office has ever run an incentive program. And many people are saying you can expect 18 months, give or take, for them to spin up a rebate program. So we're looking at a period of time 
where the tax credit might be in play, but it's going to be very expensive equipment. Um, and then we won't have the re rebates for moderate and low income people just yet. And so if we can be influential to get this um, very attractive rebates from Excel to have modest equipment, you know, good efficiency, but modest efficiency, I think we will have done the citizens of Colorado a really good service by giving them affordable heat pumps, uh, you know, modestly affordable heat pumps. Um, um, right. in the near term. And, um, and I think that's good business, of course, for all of us on the call. Makes sense. And, yep. and Jonathan, you brought up another fabulous point, which that if ever there was a group that is perfectly positioned to assist the Colorado Energy Office in figuring this IRA bill out in such a way that we can make these, especially the low income incentives available, because I have no clue how you give a tax credit to low-income people to buy a heat pump? <laughs> how do you do that? They don't pay taxes. Well, you can't. You can't use both. That's they made it easy for us. Um, no, Rob, you can. You, I, our 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 legal team said you. It's an either or, but you well, know only for the electrification incentives versus the modeled savings incentives. Tax credits apply. You can double dip all day long in the tax credits. Yeah, pretty, that, pretty that's correct. correct. So I'm going to, that is a great segue to the last piece on my agenda for us to hit really fast is um, I've been gathering the research so far and you know, like the, on the IRA, on the, um, the infrastructure act that um, who has the best information. And we know Cara is the drafter of the original Hope for Homes, Cara. And um, she presented to us on that a year and something ago. Um, but there's like five different resources that we found that looking at the act, what's coming out of it, how it's gonna roll and funnel down into the Colorado Energy Office. And they're all conflicting. There's a lot of different information out there. So I'm looking to you guys, I'm gonna send you um, the list of where we've gathered the, the uh, summaries so far. You guys have the best one, but I'm going to call her directly. Want to get your feedback for the quarterly membership meeting about having her since she wrote it and got it through from Andel, the consulting group, um, have her present on what's in it, how it's, you know, what got changed, where it's going. And I'm wondering, we need to push the Color Energy Office. They have not been on top of this for the last two years. I was wondering, yeah. At all. As far as I can tell, like when they came to our meeting when she presented a year ago saying, we don't really know what's going. We're going to come to your meeting and find out. So you're talking about Kara? Is that who you said, Patricia? Kara. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. And so I'm thinking and want to get your feedback um, that we have her come and speak and have Colorado Energy Office come and put them on the spot in December and have them tell them now so that they are able to come and tell us how they're prioritizing the money and the categories and what's coming through and what they're thinking. Because I think we probably are gonna have to influence them as well because I think they're focusing on a lot of um, more heady things that are not reality-based where this is super reality-based. That's my opinion. So any feedback on that? approach and if I, I can't think of a more important subject to be talking about okay. I mean you know when I read the the initial story on the IRA it was like I am just going to become mechanical contractor selling heat pumps to low-income people for free that's all I'm going to do for the next five years is that Ara all over again oh it's it's 10 times Ara Ara was a nightmare yeah. I lived through Ara there was nothing I know. we Ara. all did <laughs> a lot of us do yeah. But this is 10 years worth, like, supposedly. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, so you agree. I think that, is she the best source? Is there somebody yes. else you recommend? I think no, every she, source we can get our hands on is valuable. Yeah. And they, they just published, uh, so Eric was talking about the webinar, which I attended, which was excellent. It was really full featured. Uh, they did not record it. They only allowed like it was they're they're trying to monetize all this work, um, which, yeah. you know, rightly said she's been working on this for 10 years. 
Um, but they did put out a summary sheet and I'm trying to find the link to that. That was publicly uh, publicized and I will put that into the chat room in a minute as soon as I can find it. Um, that summary sheet is, is really solid. It walks through everything they, they talked about um, in the presentation. So I'll get that up here as soon as I can find what browser tab it's in. But I agree, she would be amazing to have on, especially in a couple months when they figure more things out. That's what I'm biggest, thinking. Right, the biggest take that I got from, from that presentation is that they don't know yet what the DOE exactly. rules are gonna be, right? There was a, um, the, the, the Hope for Homes Act was 100 pages and it got whittled down to 20. And so, because it was a reconciliation bill, so they couldn't put any of the rules in there. So now the DOE's got to go and write all the rules and create the request for proposals that they then send out to the 50 state energy offices. And then those guys have to write a response. So right now the Colorado Energy Office can't even really design their program because they don't even know what the rules are going to be yet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's going to take time. That's why I was thinking if we wait to sell that coalesces and gets clear, hopefully she'll have she can come and talk to us. I feel like she's I mean, sore. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt we should be pushing the energy office to like say, let's go, let's go. And how are you going to do this? And let's help you write a plan. Um, I think that's really important. And um, so there's so there's definitely some some things to look yeah. at there. But like we later on back into that RFP, like you need to be talking to the businesses, not all the environmentalist yeah. groups. Right. That's right. So Okay, then I'm putting those states with like energy offices with three or four staff, you know. <laughs> <They're good. laughs> exactly, exactly. So yeah, so I will, um, so with that confirmation, I'm going to work on talking to her now since she's already presented to us. It, she's, a, she's a consultant for some of our members. That's how we got her to come speak to us. So I think we'll be able to do that again. Um, and then I think we should, start working with car energy office to position because we will and can be the squeaky wheel if we need to be so and i think we'll have a lot of knowledge to help them yeah i think by december you know having them come in and talk about how they're how they see the implementation of the incentive dollars incentive programs going would be you know by then hopefully they they've started <laughs> Yeah. to think it through right. i just found that link and it's in chat now um so it's uh that's their summary sheet that they put out they they made that public um so that's available and then just in case you're curious we at it, snug homes website i put a link a little bit further up we did a flow chart that just makes it a lot easier to visualize how you get the various funds for the, the for the model per program versus the pay for performance program as part of hope for homes so oh, nice. thank you makes it a little and, easier and of course if our approach with the colorado energy office is how can we assist you yeah right. they're much more likely yeah listen to yep. us then let us explain to you how you need to write this plan yeah yeah well and let us help bring the knowledge like what do they need to know to help them write the plan like you're saying how can we help you um and we have a great relationship with them by the way they hired the ebc and they probably don't remember it even but we um, did a report on what uh, the barriers are in Colorado to accelerating heat pump installs. And that um, should be probably included in the data to them. And that came from six utilities, manufacturers, and contractors and distributor interviews. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, great. Thank you for that, because that is something I've been mulling around to make a decision for. Um, and that, so I think our, our quarterly membership meeting is going to include that because it's all industries involved, as well as a report out on where we are with Deets and Davis and Howard on um, intervening for all our groups. And I'm looking to, if you have any insulation contacts at anything from manufacturer distributors to contractors that we might need to pull together a group like this for them to get ahead of this and the rebates are, they are minimal for insulation. They need to be updated. OC in the last round, Owens Corning did put together an attic um, incentive 
that's like a cafeteria plan. Like you add on R value um, based on where they're starting with their insulation. There's no option for that currently. It's either nothing or uh, you, you can't start if you have you know, an R value of nine <laughs> and add on. So um, anything else, you guys, this has been a fantastic conversation. And I think it's positioning us to get a lot of um, the issues on the table and for us to be thinking about what to look for when we dig into the plan. So anything else before we go? This is an awesome group, you guys. Like, I totally think we make a difference. Can you reiterate what you were speaking of as far as installation and home, for, home performance contractors? I didn't catch all that. Yeah, so um, from earlier when Howard and I think Rob commented about um, and Adam about the insulation, the other areas in the plan that impact the heat pump installs and the quality of installs and the success of those installs. So insulation, the whole home, um, air sealing insulation and the whole home approach, um, we need to look into that as well. And um, what is really needed to support, maybe EVC says we're gonna take a holistic approach as well, which means I have to spin up a shell envelope, whole ohm insulation air sealing group for them to do what this group is doing to put their proposals in for, you know, is that wall, attic, you know, air sealing, what needs to be tackled um, that's gonna be complementary and support the success of okay. the group. Yeah. Um, no, it sounds good. And I can't really say anything that Adam didn't already mention earlier. I spoke to him in the chat about that. Um, just wanted to echo the importance and underscore that as well. It's the most undersold, underappreciated yeah. aspect of all this performance work. So if you do have a group or something does come to fruition, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can send me a note or something. I'm trying to stay in the loop, but I'd be very interested to, to stay in the loop with that as that were to develop. Can you put that in the chat so we have a, we make sure we don't miss it? I would, I would say it's a good plug for the BPI certification that you're uh, hopefully going to have John Jones or Larry Zarker on for which meeting is that next? Is it the next like all meeting or just a specific meeting? Uh, that is the quarterly membership meeting, um, which is on December 15th. So ironically, it's September 15th um, that, that BPI is going to be talking about their certification um, for uh decarbonization that they're they're launching right. that here in September and then the next meeting for us to um, include and have the federal uh, incentive um, from the IRA Act is going to be December 15th as well same time Thursday yeah. morning 730 to, yeah. to Robin, I, I agree that like I, I'd be happy to and Patricia, I'd be happy to chair or be part of um, a, uh, a whole home specific component of EEBC. Um, that's that's where my heart is and where I'm really focused on. And um, but Robin, BPI is actually coming up with a new credential that goes on top of a building analyst that is a home decarbonization specialist. And so it's the training necessary to understand how to put all the pieces of the puzzle together without screwing up, <laughs> right? That's like, awesome. Yeah, so, I so heard that. The whole, the whole deal. And so yeah. I, I was on the committee that helped write the curriculum and everything. And um, so there's a lot coming there. Like there's a lot of folks working on how do we do whole home? How do we do include renewables, batteries, EVs? Let's put and, it all together. And that's an add-on to what credential? the bpi analyst so it's a it's a certificate from bpi that called whole, uh building decarbonization specialist yeah i i got that email from larry this week great um so question uh, and i know we got to roll off this call um is when we say so the whole home which includes and what you just said um which the ev the solar the insulation, the air sealing, the shell. I was thinking going towards the shell envelope group and then this other load shifting um, 
uh, emerging or not emerging, but technology side, like trending technologies. Whole oh, home can it can group all those groups, or do you think that it those are separate ones? I'm struggling um, with this because I was like, it used to be just insulation and air sealing, and that's not the world we're in anymore. It's a combination of all those things. I mean, you know, when we're when we're looking at whole home, we're paying attention to time of use pricing. And we're like what, what Radiant's doing is trying to be able to apply the hourly energy models to that so you can actually calculate, um, you know, effects, uh, time of use effects on the grid as well as the savings uh, by taking advantage of those things. So Excel does have that rate case or that, that, that rate uh, option. And we haven't even, I haven't even tested that. I've, I've done a bunch of tests on PRPA and Fort Collins and it's insane how much you can save by, by throwing a battery on their system and charging uh, off peak and, and, dis, and discharging during peak because um, they don't really have any rules on that. But um, Excel's got different situations. It, it, absolutely, it's important. Uh, it's got its own world. Is it a separate committee? I don't know. Okay. We'd be, I think I'd be happy to like incorporate it into whole home, but I don't know. It's, there's a lot of stuff uh, behind that. So, so, so the, label, the, label, the label we use for that is DER, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we've got all that stuff categorized in DER just to keep our heads straight. And, and that's just going to, that literally is going to become a new business opportunity is as we get more and more time of use rates, there will be a phenomenal need for people who are experts in how do you, uh, how, about how, when you use energy, not just how much energy do you yeah. use, but when do you use it? Right. And, and the people that solve those puzzles and, and the, the maddening thing about that, as our friend from LPEA will, will attest to, is there are like 4,000 utilities in the United States. And so you got to solve that problem in 4,000 different locations. Every so, one of them's got a different rate for the system. And realize, I, I think those that, that aren't aware, you know, Excel is putting in advanced meters. Yep. For all their customers, they're in the middle of that. And It'll be done in the two years. Building it out heavily at this point in next year. By I think the end of next year, it'll be, you know, two thirds of households will have them, and as neighborhoods get them within six months, I believe, customers are, are be, being put on a new time of use tariff. That's yeah. the default tariff. It's already been approved. Mm -hmm. Rates are out there. And uh, if you want to so, bail, bail on the time of use, you got to have to pay more to get back on a flat rate. <laughs> So here's the challenge that I, in which I'm going down the rabbit hole a little bit, is that um, our members, though, member contractors are not all the things we're using, like DER and all these things, like these words. This is the progressive group that understands all that. They don't. And I feel like if I create a DER group, they won't go, oh, I'm supposed to be in that group. I feel like yeah, I have to use more Patricia, words to I would, understand. I would I, I really appreciate your instincts on this. And you know, the old saying, the uh, perfect is the devil of just good enough. And and I don't wanna sound critical of people that take a whole home approach. I get it, it's awesome. Um, and it's it's probably for society, the right way to go. We, but there are gonna be lots of good contractors who just wanna be good at heat pumps and they probably should have a friend who can do insulation and refer. Um, maybe that's a friend they meet in the EBC. But if the EBC becomes a club of the purists, yeah, I know. well, we'll scare off the the good heat pump only guy who's you know just focused. I mean, and and, and straightforward. And and similarly, we need those contractors who really just work on shell measures and insulation and air sealing and things like that and in the group and who don't want to take on the, the real deep science that Adam, I mean, I'm, I'm totally impressed with your level of knowledge and understanding of this and I celebrate it, but I worry for the health of a big tent that, that um, EBC has, I think always been, maybe I'm wrong, but 
I, I think you need a big tent to be successful as an organization. So just, you know, just be, be go slow and carefully. And I think you'll stay, you know, a big tent. I think that's why I, and that's why I brought up earlier. I'm like, I don't want to lose our energy efficiency gas contractors either because we've jumped so far that they can't relate and see a place for them to have a voice. And so there is, you know, and I think that's where I'm looking at it. Maybe it should be more of a, even saying shell envelope, you know, is, is a little tough, you know, for the insulators and air sealers are, are behind on this unless they've been working with, you know, they're doing a spray foam, right? They get it because they're doing the ACHs for those builders. So um, I'm trying to uh, balance what these groups to attract the ones that need to attack the whole home side, you know, but from each one of their businesses part. So thank yeah, you. I, 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 I very much agree. the conversation. Yeah. What's that? AER is more like an, that's an educational, that's a, that's a webinar subject. That's not a group. That's yeah. a, here's okay. where things are going eventually. Isn't this interesting as opposed to, you need to get on board with this. <laughs> yeah. And I think that comes down to, but first I like uh, Casey, you know, from Dietz and Davis, you guys are like, oh, it should be a DR group. And I was like, that's I think too narrow. And then we came up with like the load shifting, you know, and the, I didn't want to say emerging technologies because then that'll off put like Excel will see that as different than trending technologies, right? So I was trying to go, oh, it's, I'm trying to find the spot for everybody to work on being the people are not even the first adopters. Like you guys are the innovators, right? You're running way fast thinking about all the, those things about in the marketplace that are happening. And then we've got to connect to the front lines. That's where our bread and butter is. The front lines get left holding the bag, no matter what Excel and IRA and all these groups come up with. And our job is to make it easy for them to actually install everything we're coming up with. So. Anyway, that's, thank you for that. That was helpful um, for me to think about how to get those other groups spun up like this group. So I, I'm gonna need to sign off here. Yep. Something else at, at, at five, but this has been very helpful and I'm sure we'll, this is just the beginning of the, of the conversation. Yes, it is. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, sure. Casey. Good talk for, to for you teeing all. Up. Yeah. Thanks all, take care. Awesome. Thank Cheers. Yeah, thanks, everyone. See ya. I agree with the, the, the last five minutes of comments. And beginning with the end in mind is important, right? We have to know where we're going yeah. and pave a pathway for whoever wants to join when they're ready. Mm -hmm. You know. And I think I, that's the part that I have to balance a lot and not get sucked into just the future because that's where, you know, it's a blast. Yeah. <laughs> Figuring out where we're going. Hi, Robin. I Hey, I liked, I just wanted to chime in. I liked the turn. I felt like the meeting kind of took a pivot and went in a cool direction. I'm pretty unfamiliar. So I'm trying to get up to speed on the EEBC mm. and, you know, here at the LPEA, I'm like the heat pump guy. So I'm always trying to kind of keep my ear to the ground, but I come from a really strong weatherization and building performance background. So anytime I hear something like that, man, my ears perk up and like preach, you know, like, talk about it like uh, Adam was going off and I think that will be like an unforeseen you know catch 22 with the uh, rollout of heat pumps if you're just throwing them in where you you mentioned something with like an R9 it's going to backfire people are going to be pissed so um, important to keep in mind so again yeah. you know if something does come to fruition or develop along that building envelope or whatever you want to call it kind of group I just want to be sure I kind of got my ear to the ground and can stay in the loop. I'd you know, love to and see how that develops. Robin, we need to get you guys to join the EBC. You guys are not members of the EBC. So how does that work? And I was you able to spot. register. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's so like we, above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so what, what has been interesting is we, in far, four years ago, we did not have other um, utilities or co-ops or anyone coming into our meetings. And now, because I think everything's collapsing, right? Between um, what we're trying to accomplish between the cities and the 
manufacturers and the other utilities. Um, you know, this is this group is specifically started for Excel and intervening with the IOUs. But you guys aren't followed. You don't have those requirements, and you're progressive. And so, um, so we created. I created an a um, industry partner, and so you would fall under the industry partner group. And so I need to probably send you an application. I did a bunch of work with you um, when uh, we did that research with a different group of people um, um, that were working on heat pumps. So um, yeah, I, let's just have an offline conversation. Sure. I think it's really important to have your perspective in this group. So, um, and then I'm spinning up the next group I think Sean, you had recommended also. Um, who was it that retired from uh, Fort Collins Utilities? Oh yeah, uh, Kim Devoe. Yeah, and Kim, I originally tried to get to be uh, the one. That, thank you, Sean, for being a co-chair um, for him to do that. But his passion is more what you're talking about, Robin, about like the shell and the whole home. And so I'm thinking. I was thinking I might reach back out to him. He's been retired. At first he was in, and then he's like, no, I would just want to ski. <laughs> you know? like, I just retired. I'm not going to be. He's like, I'm not going to jump in and do something yet. But now that he's been retired for a year, practically, he might say, hey, this is exciting things going on. And this is where um, maybe he could, you know, be a chair now because he's. Yeah. Robin, your uh, LPEA is Long's Peak. Is that right? Uh, La Plata. La Plata. La Plata. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. So Durango and Pagosa. Nice. So um, have you. yeah, energy management advisor here and kind of odd in that I had my own company and still do oh. um, doing energy efficiency consulting, like BPI energy audits. So work nice. four tens with LPEA and then can still do consulting stuff on like Fridays. So it's weird in that I swap hats you know, yeah. depending on what day of the week. Right. Yeah, which that? makes you see, understand it much more closely than the front lines, right? You are both. Oh, I've I've got stories to tell. I've been in the crawl spaces. I've been in the attics. I've, blood, I've bled. I've worked at weatherization <laughs> assistance programs for a number of years. I've done it all. Um, seen a little bit of everything. So, yeah. It's awesome, yeah. man. Good for you. That's <laughs> that's kind of my background as well as a, as a, a range of energy efficiency, BPI, ResNet, HERS ratings, um, as well as weatherization and field training and that kind of stuff, you know, a bunch of certifications, et cetera. But we need, we need young educated folks such as yourself, experienced folks such as yourself to really step in and start to take over the reins. So welcome, mm -hmm. congrats. Yeah. Quick question, are you doing load calculations, heating heat load calculations as well? Is that part of your service? Not. I haven't needed to. I could, but I haven't needed to. Or there hasn't been any interest. I mean, a lot of the guys around here, they don't want to be bothered to be splitting hairs and doing load calcs. And then I think a lot of the time people are doing these retrofits because it's like, yeah, the master bedroom's too hot or too cold, and they still have their primary, you know, natural gas heat source. And so you got, you know, heat pump contractor coming in and it's just kind of you know throw throw in a half ton or whatever so it's not a lot of whole house retrofits where a load calc will be a little bit more relevant so i think that and then the adoptions ramping up you know so i think you'll see more of that but right now no yeah i would i would consider positioning yourself for that when it's time because the jurisdictions as they continue to adopt and the and mm -hmm. the overview and review process is going to expand and, and get more robust. Um, and with all the different capabilities of variable capacity heat pumps, whether it be a single ducted system that's just retrofit, uh, but taking into account the fact that, oh, wait, there's new windows. Oh, wait, you wrapped your house. Oh, wait, you did some air sealing. Uh, oh, wait, you bumped out that portion of the house and you're now you want to put in a single heat pump that does both pieces. Right, mm -hmm. so that that skill set is going to be. Um, I agree with you that they haven't been bothered, and most HVC contractors haven't been bothered. As a matter, they're of too practice. busy. 
yeah they're too busy now too like i'm trying to get out quality installer rebates to guys and they're just like yeah i don't care it's not worth my time it's like one of these guys was um echoing i can't justin i can't remember his name he's just like yeah he's just not worth their time can't be bothered they're just yes yeah, spread, spread so thin they can't hire anybody they're just like i'm just trying to slap these things in and go on to the next one yeah so well, and i think that um i i wonder like i'm reading between the lines and talking about you know the contractors are like i'm not going to bother with this little itty bitty rebate i'm too busy so how do we come up with a recommendation to make those rebates easy and somehow attractive that they can add them in without having to do much like isn't that part of the problem the barrier well i think a lot of it too is just like i've i've sat down with um a guy recently i'm like look man it's not that bad and like walked him through it i think it's a lot of it some of it's just teaching an old dog new tricks and just kind of being like look it's two pieces of paper you know you can fill it out with the with the client's rebate and then that's kind of like a you know, an, an offering with your package, like, hey, I'll do all this for you. And so I think that's a bit of a hurdle. And then people just being resistant to change or just like an aversion to paperwork. You're like, oh, you know, some well, amount of paperwork, you know. Let me throw this out there. Let's see how it sits for you. Um, do you think with the, the IRA 10-year plan with all this stuff, if we were, and, and a couple of people mentioned, like, Hey, we don't actually, we might not need utility incentives, right? And so just remove the incentive model away from the contractor's requirements and filling out paperwork and all that stuff. And it just goes to the tax level for the homeowner. Um, and, and then also incentives on the, we're looking at, at manufacturer seeing as incentives around getting away from just AC only equipment and shifting air conditioners to heat pumps as a matter of this is what's available in the market. If you want to put in HVAC, you're putting in effectively a dual fuel system or a full, fully, you know, uh, full heat pump, cold climate, yeah. whatever. Commit, fully commit. Yeah. I don't because know. We've been trying to, we've been banging on contractors for, I have for, 13 years about low calcs and it's oh, yeah. gotten better but it yeah, I mean, you got cool calc now I, I keep trying to push people to cool calc at least because it least. seems to be the most streamlined thing yeah i'm training my world. son i'm training my son he's he's uh, 19 years old i'm training i'm teaching him how to do load calcs with cool calc i'm like dude if you got the information in front of you you can get a cool calc done in 10 minutes and that's good money for a young you know a young computer savvy person Maybe that's what we should say. The re- we they should pump way more money into doing load calc rebates. Mm, maybe, maybe. I mean, it's still kind of running into that guys not want to do paperwork and being too busy. But I mean, I could see that. I could see that sticking with somebody who's like got the savvy. They see the the benefit and kind of going out of their way to do the paperwork. I you know I have contractors like that too. So it's just different mindsets. Yep. So. I don't know. And there are different, I've heard of different where they've eliminated practically all the paperwork and um, and just grabbing three things. (laughs) Like if you could see, (laughs) if you could take, so they were saying, I think it's Scott Sudroth from PRPA. He's like, what if we didn't have him fill out the form and they just take a picture of the number on the, the load calc and like done, like, Here's my name, here's the address, and here's the result. Boop, take a picture of it, send it in. Just, yeah, with their mobile, like, gone, done. Yeah, yeah. and if you could, like, take a picture of the unit serial number and, and that. Oh, and as far as, like, here it is installed. Yeah, like, like, here it is done, and then here's the hack the, job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they, like, so they'd be more likely to do that if they got a $500 rebate for doing that load calc and they had Maybe. to take. Maybe we, we have an app for registering equipment and that enables them to offer 12 years or 10 years warranties instead of five and seven. Ooh, that's they, cool. won't, they won't even register equipment. Yeah. Like they won't use an app 
and okay. snap a picture so then, of a QR code and fill okay. in five fields. So what if we go around yeah. and the EPC starts a company and that's all we do and we process every freaking utilities rebates and we do all their load calcs and we get paid two hundred dollars a load calc. Yeah, I mean, I think there's <laughs> so many so many crazy opportunities. Yeah, Robin, I'm glad you're you're trying to capitalize on both of them. So you know, well, it's it's just it's also too. It's something I am passionate about, and it just needs to be done. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, going circling back to the whole building envelope thing, what Adam was saying, like that's something I really strongly believe and know to be true. Right. And so it's something that I didn't want to just completely step away from. Plus, it was like my company I started. So I didn't want to just like abandon it. Um, but it, mm. it it's a need that needs to get filled. There's not enough people like savvy to it or doing it. And then just trying to keep getting on the soapbox and blasting the info out there like you know um anyway that's where that's my little soapbox that's where i'm awesome. at very cool but right. right on i gotta jump myself yeah thanks for playing you. you guys that was an hour extra than everybody planned on <laughs> yeah, it was good <laughs> but i have to say this is the first time we've included our attorneys and we have howard to represent us and so i feel like him hearing you guys talk about the things you talk about in the past Howard, I felt like was going to be too much of an environmentalist in, in his approach, but hearing us talking, I know that it's shifting his thoughts about before he's like, get rid of gas lines immediately. And I'm like, Howard, you can't do that. That's, that's not right. thing, like you that's said. The People are going to get pitchforks if you do that. And like, you know, then you, have, you, you have can't like... represent us because that's not what my group is going to do. My group is going to be divided and I got to come up with a solution that can meet the front lines needs and the progress in a balanced way that we can actually make it happen in the marketplace. Yeah. Well, I'd like to see people just getting rid of 80% furnaces it's like fine if you really want to go with a furnace you got to go with the 95 or like 95 percenter right and i could see like pulling the rebates for it to just slowly you know just pull it away you know and i'm sure i don't know if y'all heard about crested butte outlawing gas with new construction i think more of that is going to be you happening here about that crested butte crested butte, crested butte outlawing and what did gas they do? and new construction yep they wow. did what so Crested Butte outlawed gas with new construction. Wow. So I think you're going to see more stuff like that. So I'm, I'm kind of throwing that out when people, I, had, I was talking to a member today and he's like, oh, you know, I want to do all electric, but heat pumps, they only go down to 32 degrees. And he's like starting to go. And I was like, let me interrupt you. Hold on one second. Cold climate heat pumps, they'll go down to like negative 22 and beyond and like educated this guy. But I keep throwing that example out there. Yeah. And I'm like, if you're skeptical about heat pumps working at 6,500 feet or 7,000 feet, Crested Butte's like 8,500 feet or 8,800 feet or something like that. Yeah. And they get dumped on and they just outlaw gas and new construction. Yeah. So That's more huge. of that, I think seeing more of that, but it needs to happen. And I think with the IRA coming on board and when everybody finally knows what's, how it's going to play out, I think like the floodgates are just going to open. So I wonder if we could, and you know what? Um, it, it seems like that kind of feels like a panel discussion to me because um, that's the same with Holy Cross. So with Mary Cross is the same and with Mary and um, if Crested Butte, like if there are three uh, markets who have done that and they're all in the mountains, like right. it totally debunks it, you know what I yeah. mean? In, in saying that they don't work well let's talk about where they are working and they've pulled gas yeah i can't you can't really get much consistently gnarlier than right like it's, some account like summit county or like leadville or yeah you know, yeah some of these I mean, high mountains that yeah. might be a cool webinar to do instead of saying do this with the rebates and do this and do that why don't we just say put it to the test you know, but... Damn, let's give you like, <laughs> let's give you real case studies, you know? Yeah. Um, maybe. Yeah. I just, that would be a good contractor. Um, maybe probably distributor too. Right, Sean? Like they need it as much. Uh, but... Yeah. I mean, we've got the, we've got the, the examples. We don't have, I don't have, I, I mostly have no idea where our stuff is, but you know, we've got one <laughs> installed at the top of Snowmass 
at 11,300 yeah. feet, it does all the heating for a 2,000 square foot uh, ski patrol uh, building up there. Oh, oh nice. Cool. You know? So, I mean, I've got, I've got stuff in Leadville, I've got stuff in Frazier. Um, the, they're all over the place. Um, do you know where, uh, what is it? Um, Montezuma, Montezuma, we've got stuff up County? there. It's next oh, to, oh, oh, outside of Keystone. Tiny little place out of sight of Keystone. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've been there. Oh yeah, I used to live in Summit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, back in the day. I was working at Northwest Cog, if y'all are familiar. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Doug, yeah, um, know, Doug and Nate. <laughs> Doug is the man. That dude is yeah, so cool. They're good uh, people. Yeah. I was back there uh, working when it was still Doug and Nate, but Steve Getz was the mm. manager, director, or whatever. Now it's Doug. Yeah. So that's how far um, back I go. I, I, I am literally in Aura. Like, that's the reason I moved to Colorado. I got a weatherization job. I was doing weatherization in North Carolina moved to Colorado to Summit County because you know the funding doubled and I got an R job. Nice. So, again, near and dear to my heart. And here's, here we are full circle. You, so I'm like, you, you look do you it. look too young for that. Again. Let's do you it. look too young for that, but so all right. Here's I gotta go. I, but I, I just, I'm gonna I'm go glad to have met you, Robin. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah, um, yeah, y'all too.